the final proof, which I didn't do here because it was too elaborate, is just go look up the full prescribing information for any of the major psychiatric drugs. Just put it in Google, full prescribing information for Abilify, full prescribing information for Paxo, and just look through all of the things they're warning you about. And they can't even prove the drugs work. Ultimately, you can only prove these drugs work by cheating, being cheating drug companies who can purposely conduct very short term, four, five, three, four, five, six week studies, hire the people to do the work, their own paid guys. And now the, there's legislation passed a while back where the drug companies pay the FDA to expedite getting through the uh, approval process. So not only, as, as was mentioned earlier, are, are the people working at the FDA going to work for the drug company afterward, which is exactly what happened with the 20-year guy I used to confront in, uh, all the time in public or by writing, um, name was Lieber. I mean, he went to work as a consultant for the drug companies. No wonder he was protecting the companies. It's absolutely true that the, the uh, FDA is now an arm of the industry. And it happens in a lot of things in the government. But it's an arm of the industry. I forced them through my, my first book and through being on Dan Rather, who was the biggest TV guy at the time years ago, I forced them to greatly increase their warnings about antipsychotic drugs. Big PR campaign and, the, and this big TV special. And I read the introduction that Paul Lieber gave to the first meeting with all of the pharmaceutical companies to talk about, about it. And he said, well, I didn't think this was necessary, but then I started asking some doctors and they didn't really know that much and there's been this big campaign, so we've got to upgrade. And then he said, but don't worry, nothing I'm going to do is going to hurt your sales, your company. How can you monitor somebody how can you be a policeman who swears I'll never hurt you? How can you do anything really good that involves protecting people if you're not going to defend the people? I, it, it's, it's beyond belief, but maybe I'm getting it across to you, just how bad it is. So what happens when you get a blow on, a head, on the head or an electroshock treatment or you take a psychiatric drug, or you smoke a lot of dope, or drink a lot of alcohol. It's very simple. By the way, this kind of lecture is never given in med school. It's, these are simple truths that, that they don't tell people, because it, you see what it would do. Well, there's only really two or three directions the brain goes in when it's hurt. You see, the brain has to function well to be as complicated as we are. But when you hurt the brain, it gets really limited in what it can do. Is that clear? Uh, no one's going to tell you that med school because it's going to undo so much of what's being done, including, you know, giving anesthesia so easily to people and children because follow-ups, you know, anesthesia is dangerous. No as near as dangerous as stuff I'm talking about, but it is intoxicating the brain. Many, most anesthesias are, are relate, anesthetics are related to the benzodiazepines. So there's about three things that can happen to the brain. The most common long-term effect of injury, whether you're a soldier who's been around too many concussions, whether you're a prize fighter and now we know uh, a football player or you've had electroshock, or you're on the neurotoxin, in the long run it's going to make you less available, less engaged, less involved in your life. And that's why, understandably, when we do that, we think we feel better, because the suffering isn't as acute. Is that clear? So the common pathway of all injuries, it may be why kids bang their heads against the walls, especially when you lock them up in institutions, because it dulls over time, gradually, imperceptibly, Often it's the husband, the wife, or the kids who notice. And it doesn't matter which of the drugs I've mentioned, really, or I'm going to mention. So 
That's the long-term effect. That's what happens from oral injury. Along the way, a second thing that happens is you can get sedated. And sedation is different than this lobotomy-like indifference. This indifference that you experience with your first dose often. See, the first doses can feel good because they're blunting you until the brain catches up and starts fighting back. And then it's an unstable free-for-all. And anything can happen to you, and we have no idea. The thing I showed you is such a tiny part of all the processes. And we don't know most of the processes. So it can sedate you, some drugs. All of them tend to have some lobotomizing effect, some indifference, because you can't do something to the whole brain without affecting your frontal lobes. It's interconnected with, every, with so much <laughs> the rest of your physiology, let alone your, the psychological portions of the brain. And the third thing they can do is they can cause euphoria. And you may have seen that in people who are brain injured. It can make you silly and shallow and think you're better than ever and think everything is great. Many times when I do a murder case, I've been involved in murder, huge murder cases, where, um, for example, I was a consultant to some of the Columbine suits, and I was a consultant to the trial of uh, the Aurora shooter who sat in front of the amphitheater and mowed people down. So I get to look inside. And often when you look at what, what is going on, during the first, second, or third visit, the, the person says, Doc, I've never felt better in my life. Now, if the doctor was sane, he'd say, we're in trouble. I mean, you actually think that the drug I've given you has made you better than you've ever been in your life? That's, that's got to be false. Nothing's changed. You're still broke. You may still be an addict. Your wife is still throwing you out. Your kid's in jail. And you're, but you feel you're better than ever? or your mother just died, or even your dog died. God knows we can get so depressed over our dog, loss of our dog. When you get older like me, you even worry about whether you can have another dog, you know? They're so important to us. So, it doesn't make any sense that a drug has made you feel better than ever. That's addiction. That's how addiction starts, even if you're not gonna get addicted to the drug. So if you're on an antidepressant, you've been going from doctor to doctor trying new drugs, new antidepressants. It's probably because you either got that very short-term euphoria, it doesn't usually last, or you got the apathy, or maybe the sedation, because all of them will distract you from the suffering we human beings go through on this terribly stressful planet on which we live, with all of our flaws and faults, struggling to make lives and to love each other. So it's not good things. Now the real danger when I see these things, when I'm going through the case, and I'm going through uh, the, the legal case, I'm going through the medical record chronologically and I see never felt better in their life. I know just what's going to happen. The person ends up in a manic episode. That's where you are euphoric out the ceiling, that's where you, you're grand and powerful. You can do anything on the face of the earth. You embezzle. I had a man who embezzled from his company and um, then set up for the company uh, a whole new tracking system for the funds, whereupon as soon as he put it up, they discovered he was embezzling. He was on Paxil. His friends thought he was on cocaine. You can't tell the difference often between the antidepressants and cocaine because they're both jacking up serotonin mightily. And that gives them, some, among other things, gives them some very similar effects at the time. In fact, um, I was the medical expert for all the initial combined Prozac suits appointed by a judge, a federal court, 100 plus suits, 150 suits. And my job was to learn everything. That's how I started to know so much. I was the first person ever got inside a company like Eli Lilly, who actually was going to look at stuff they didn't want it to look at under a court order. And um, 
I found out, and also I met the psychiatrist who was in charge at Lilly, interviewed him as a part of this huge job I had, and interviewed him to, to, to see what he was willing to tell me. And he said um, that, you know, this, I knew this drug had amphetamine-like effects. And if you mix amphetamine-like effects with depression, you get an agitated depression. And he said people who are both energized and agitated and depressed are much more likely to kill themselves. And I tried to get the FDA to put that in the label. And he's the chief in charge of doing the analysis of the adverse effects. And they didn't put it in the label. He said, I wanted to put in a stimulant syndrome into the label. Um, it took, by the way, until 2004, from the very beginning in 1994, when I was doing this conversation with him, 1992, the drug came out in about 89, for the FDA to put the stimulant label in. And they did it in part, I testified twice before them. They wanted me to talk about suicide because that's what they just wanted to evaluate the suicide labels. And I said, you gotta look further at the stimulants because they're causing violence and suicide. And they put it in. The docs don't pay any attention to it. And one reason they put it in, this shows you the holes in that awful system. The manager of the entire um, FDA committee meetings, and these are the advisory committees of the FDA, they're outside and they advise. She sent them my article, which you'll find on the website, 2003-4, uh, and it's called, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but I'll tell you how to get to it. And I have the stimulant syndrome in there, and I lectured on it, and by, by God, it's in there. I actually may be able to show you that, or at least I can read to you about it. Um, And here it is, the all psychiatric drugs, um, they just have an infinite uh, adverse effects. Now here is the FDA, this is what was taken almost word for word from my, uh, my report. I've only given this speech once, I never give the same speech twice, so I'm not always sure what's coming next. I try to make it for the audience. All patients being treated with antidepressants for any indication should be monitored appropriately and observed closely for clinical worsening. Did your doctor tell you that, folks? Out of the tens of thousands maybe going to watch this? Did he say clinical worsening? That means almost anything terrible, you can get worse. Suicidality, unusual changes in behavior. I mean, how broad is that? And boy, it's true. It'll, it can cover all kinds of unusual, because it's a, it's a roulette thing. It's a, you know, it's, it's, throwing dice, but the dice have millions of numbers on them. Um, especially during, and I mentioned to you this earlier, the initial few months of a course. Maybe I didn't mention that. So many of these violent shooters have uh, had the drug started within the last few months, so they've had a raise in the medication, or lowering, or stopping. And so at times of dose changes, so be careful about it. Don't just try to come off. And either increases, dec decreases. And um, now look at this. This is in bold in some of the labels. This is taken out of almost every antidepressant label has pretty much this in it. The following symptoms. Anxiety. This is your antidepressant you've just taken for anxiety. The following symptoms. Anxiety, agitation, panic attacks, insomnia, irritability, hostility. I was really proud. I think that's my work aggressiveness, impulsivity, akathisia, which is a feeling of being tortured from inside your body out that is just going to make you go nuts. And, and even the DSM, before they cleaned it up, said it could cause psychosis, violence, and suicide. It's a terrible feeling that makes you want to move around. and It's just awful. Um, and it's common from these drugs. And the doctors all say, oh, you're agitated and anxious, we'll increase the drug. Hypomania, mania. Remember I was telling you all this and maybe you were suspicious of me and this is out of the label. They've been reported in adult and pediatric patients being treated with antidepressants for major depressive disorder as well as other indications both psychiatric and non-psychiatric. So before you go ahead and say, oh, it's the mental patient, no. 
If you get these drugs for a headache or pain, they do, you, you're still exposed to all this. Animals get this. How toxic are these drugs? We have levels of Prozac in our drinking water. How did it get there? From people flushing down their pills. And it passes through the filters. And do you know what happens to fish who get this in either the lake water or in a tank, experimental tank with the same doses? Believe it or not, they not only get sexually aberrated, don't do what they usually do, some of them get withdrawn, some get aggressive. To females, the males will get aggressive instead of mating. Everything I'm telling you here is on a free adjunct to my website. And it's called, it's www.com, it's real simple, it's 123antidepressants.com. 123antidepressants, it's free, you can find I think now with 15 categories, and under each category is a list of scientific articles. I suppose we go up to 15 or 20 in some of them. It's well over 100 articles that I've put together over a lifetime of work so that other people can do this. And you can find it all there. Everything I'm talking about today. I also have a 1, 2, 3 antipsychotics and a 1, 2, 3 ECT. I haven't gotten to do the others yet. Um, so how can any drug do all this? Well, because it's a neurotoxin and it has a particular ability to have cocaine-like stimulating effects in some patients. In fact, it was so bad that the cheating drug company found out as they start, got their trials going that the patients were getting so much of this that they, no, they weren't going to finish the trials unless they got sedated with addictive benzodiazepines like you know, the Xanax and Ativan and Clonazepam. So they sent a secret memo. Now, obviously, I have to be telling the truth or I wouldn't be standing. And I am very lucky to be standing, as you'll find out if I get enough time. But the, uh, the drug company sent a secret memo around from their top researcher to all the people doing their bidding in the, in the trials. These are not independent trials. And it said, despite the protocol, that's the rules established by the FDA, you can give patients sedatives to sleep and to control their anxiety, agitation, insomnia, and irritability, all that stuff. So then it got to the FDA to approve Prozac. And this is important lessons for you, and it's the same in the food industry. A lot of this goes on everywhere. Um, Colin Campbell's uh, written a book um, about this. It was his, one of his newest books about what he went through um, and what he learned about all the shenanigans. So the FDA looked at all their trials, and none of them, showed effectiveness. Six or eight trials, I don't remember. Except there was some effectiveness in the two where the patients illegally against their rules got sedatives and benzos and they used those two trials. They effectively lied for the company and they approved trials not just of Prozac but Prozac and tranquilizers which could have completely have accounted for why some of the, a lot of the patients felt better. We know that, you know, tranquilizers make you feel good for a while. A lot of this is in my really early book that was a bestseller and had a big impact, which is talking back to Prozac. There's nothing in that book they could ever catch me on in multiple depositions by multiple lawyers spending millions of dollars reading talking back to Prozac. All they could do is say, I didn't tell the truth, so-and-so wasn't employed by, uh, by us. You said he was employed by us. And I said, no, he was a paid consultant, I'm sorry. Should have said that. That's the error. 